There we go. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this emergency town hall gathering, um, specifically to discuss uh, Israel's entry into the visa waiver program. We really appreciate you all uh, jumping on so quickly. Uh, I have a full conversation ready to go, but I'm delighted to say that we can open up our, our discussion tonight with Senator Chris Van Hollen, who is the U.S. Senator from the state of Maryland. Uh, prior to his election to the Senate in 2016, he represented Maryland's 8th Congressional District in the House of Representatives as a proud constituent. I'm particularly uh, delighted to point out the, the work that he's been doing on this issue for some time. On September 8th, in the lead up to the deadline, uh, the senator led an effort uh, in a letter to Secretary Blinken that was signed by 15 senators in total saying, and I quote, a two-tiered system that discriminates between different groups of U.S. citizens, a system that clearly fails to meet the reciprocity requirements of the law. Uh, yesterday on the 27th, when the announcement was made, um, the senator and a group of other colleagues sent out another statement saying, uh, reminding us that blue is blue. Let me turn it over to you, Senator Van Hollen, and thanks again for joining us. Well, Amaya, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for all the work uh, you and your colleagues do at AAI, including the board members. Uh, good to see Jim Zogby and, and others. And thank you all for joining uh, the call. Uh, I'm gonna go back a little further in time to May of this year uh, when uh, I and 15 of my Senate colleagues uh, first sent a letter uh, to Secretary Blinken and Secretary Mayorkas, making very clear uh, that we hoped that Israel would be in a position to enter the visa waiver program, but we made clear uh, that in order for it to enter the program, it had to meet the requirements of the law specifically the reciprocity requirements, uh, what we call the blue is blue uh, requirements, that every American citizen, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of nationality, regardless of religion, uh, has to be treated equally. Um, if we're going to enter into a visa waiver program, that Israel has to be on the same terms and conditions as the visa waiver programs with all other countries. Uh, and that means you have to meet certain criteria with respect to, you know, the incidence of visa turndown, but it also means uh, making sure that you meet the non-discrimination uh, blue is blue requirements. And in that letter, uh, we laid out a lot of concerns and we also asked a lot of questions. Uh, and we did get a reply to that letter. Uh, we had follow-up briefings uh, from senior level folks uh, both at uh, State Department uh, as well as the Department of Homeland Security, uh, where we asked a lot of questions. Uh, and the questions clear, the answers to those questions clearly indicated that uh, Israel had st still not met the blue is blue requirements. And so that's why we sent the follow-up letter uh, that you just mentioned, uh, Maya, because uh, we said, look, the clock is ticking. Uh, we're getting toward the end of this fiscal year, September 30th. That was the deadline uh, for uh, Israel meeting all the requirements. And it was clear that they were not on track to meet those requirements, especially when it dealt with the issue of um, Palestinian American residents um, in the West Bank. Also issues, of course, uh, with uh, American uh, Palestinian American residents of Gaza. Uh, but that there would be a two-tiered system uh, for those individuals. Um, and, you know, Am Americans who uh, did not have Palestinian ID member numbers would not be subject uh, to that system, uh, but those who did and were residents of the West Bank or, or Gaza would be subject uh, to the separate set of uh, requirements and a separate system. Uh, and that that system would be in place for at least seven months. So the position that we took was you can't enter into a, 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 this visa waiver program um, until you're fully compliant. And so let's wait seven months and let's wait till there's one system for every American. And then once Israel is completely compliant, they can enter the program. Uh, rather than enter in a program with a two-tier system uh, to begin with, uh, which clearly is not compliant uh, with the blue is blue standard. So uh, that is why we, we sent that letter. 
Uh, and as Maya said, is, those terms are clearly not met, uh, which is why Senator Schatz and I, Senator Merkley, Senator Welch um, made the statement we did yesterday. But I know all 15 senators who, who signed that letter um, obviously recognize that those compliance standards uh, have not been met. Now, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, progress has been made uh, in terms of travel uh, for Palestinian Americans uh, to Israel. Uh, and we are seeing, of course, more and more Palestinian Americans being able to fly to Ben Gurion. That, of course, it should never have been the case that we couldn't, uh, but the idea was to use the visa waiver program as leverage to make improvements. And I, I do think because of uh, the work of many of you on this call and certainly um, my 15 Senate colleagues and I, we've seen more improvements than we otherwise would have seen. However, the test is very clear. Again, blue is blue. And on its face, when you have a different system for applications, that's a two-tiered system. And so this is why we uh, believe that the administration um, went forward without meeting the requirements of the law and why we will continue uh, now to really uh, exercise vigilance, um, both in terms of making sure that the uh, commitments to move into one system uh, by seven months from now are met, but also all the other issues uh, related to uh, the discrimination of Palestinian Americans. And as I think all of you know, and many of you have sadly experienced um, that kind of uh, discrimination, uh, there are a whole set of issues about being able to rent cars, uh, what happens when you get to checkpoints, um, and all sorts of issues where I have said to both Secretary Blinken and Secretary Mayorkas, it simply is unfair and discriminatory uh, that, you know, I or, or, or they um, would not face the kind of requirements and conditions that are applied to, to Palestinian Americans or other, um, um, in some cases, uh, Americans of Jordanian descent and other Arab Americans. So uh, the, the sad fact is uh, that the administration moved forward when compliance had not yet been met. Uh, we all hope that it will be met, I certainly do. But uh, in the meantime, it's gonna be very important that we uh, use all the reporting mechanisms available uh, to uh, shine a light uh, on instances where uh, there is uh, ongoing discrimination. Uh, and I'm talking about beyond the separate system that's gonna be in place for at least seven months. I'm just talking about the importance of using the portal that's being established by the State Department uh, to make sure people tell their stories. Um, and I would also encourage um, uh, all of you to you know, talk to others to make sure that they do that uh, because we do wanna continue to put pressure on the Biden administration and of course on the government of Israel uh, to uh, come into full compliance. I will close with this. Um, it is. It was a big mistake, um, and I think a a, a a a not just not just from doing the right thing to do, uh, but also uh, from a legal perspective uh, for the Biden administration to move in this program uh, when you do not have full compliance with blue is blue. Let's also continue to make sure uh, that we do everything we can. Uh, to move the system um, as fast as possible into 100% compliance so that every American, regardless of race, nationality, religion, is treated fairly and equally. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for standing up for that principle.
Thank you so much, Senator Van Hollen, for your leadership on so many issues, in, including this. We truly appreciate it. I just want to point out that we've dropped in the chat already the uh, complaint form uh, to document and submit your story from the U.S. Embassy, as well as the Institute's form, because we are tracking these stories. Uh, I know that you took us back a period. Jim, uh, I'm going to ask you to come in and regrettably take us back decades, because this is uh, an old issue. Please uh, come on in. Look, I... I... I got a call as I wrote in the in the note from uh, a very high official at Homeland Security the the night before the announcement saying, uh, I know you're going to be disappointed. And I told him I'm not disappointed. I'm angry. Um, and I'm angry because I have uh, been talking with them now for months about the very issues that the senator raised, about the lack of compliance, about the history of noncompliance. Um, and more than that, uh, I've been working on this issue for more than 40 years. The kinds of stories that we've collected, um, the incidents of, of discrimination, uh, both at entry and at exit, um, uh, are are shocking. I mean, I think that the senator and Sam later on, Sam Bahur is with us, is gonna, are going to talk about some of the technical issues of being a Palestinian American in the West Bank and the issues that you have to face. But I'm just talking about being a person of Arab descent going into the airport and trying to get into the, the airport. If you're allowed into Ben Gurion Airport, um, I was working with Vice President Gore in the 90s and would be held for four hours with questions that were obviously humiliating um, and were repeated over and over again by one questioner after another. And then after you get in, that's only half the battle. The other battle is when you leave, going through the same process all over again. Um, and, you know, we had, we've had stories from, from uh, people born here, uh, Palestinian Americans born here, who submit their American passport and are told, you're not an American, we consider you Palestinian. Go and leave, go the other way through the Jordan. Uh, he said, but I have a passport. And he said, the, the Israeli guy said, do you want, what do you want me to do, genuflect in front of it? Um, you're Palestinian, go. And that's the end of the story. And there have been numerous stories of that sort that just continue to uh, rankle. Um, and we've gone to citizen um, affairs at the State Department. We've gone to the consulate in Jerusalem back when it existed. We've gone to the assistant secretary. I've brought people over to the assistant secretary of state, Ann Patterson. They told their stories. Um, and the best we get is, oh, that's terrible, we're concerned, we'll look into it. There's never been a repercussion. Um, so here's the point. They knew Israel is not in compliance back then and now. And the stories that have been collected that you're going to hear about later uh, make it clear that even during the so-called trial period, they weren't doing it. Um, and what bothered us about this process, and you're going to hear about that from Abed uh, Ayub in, in a little bit, was that the U.S. created, through a memorandum of understanding with the Israelis, a process uh, for the period of testing. But they allowed, literally allowed Israel to write the rules for the test. And I thought, wow, when I was in school, that would have been great. You know, you get a test and you write the rules and you write the questions and you say, hey, I passed. I got it all right. Um, they set the time, just about six weeks. They set the terms of who would be included, Palestinians who had an ID so that they're already in the Israeli system and they're screened and scanned and they've got all their information uh, possible. And um, uh, and they, they, they literally gave them a pass. They said, okay, we'll give you six weeks to see if you do it. Oh my goodness, you've done it. But other problems continue to exist. And well, like I said, we got repeated reports that, that, from people who were being uh, taken out and treated in a very shabby manner. You'll hear about those stories. Um, and so they didn't comply. Even with the test they created, they didn't comply. And yet the U.S. gave them this. And so I'm not disappointed. I'm furious. And I'm insulted that my citizenship rights as an American are not treated the same as others who would go and travel as tourists or as American Jews going to um, to to Israel, et cetera, and have literally a free pass to do whatever they want. So frankly, it, it's an issue that is deeply troubling. And um, and it it you know as I've pointed out for years, 
there is um it's not just this this visa waiver provision in the passport it specifically says that the secretary of state guarantees that you will be protected and er tells the country that you're visiting that you will be protected by the united states and there is i've continued to re report on this uh, a 1951 U.S. treaty with Israel on friendship, commerce, and navigation that says that, um, where is it? It says, ah, that visitors, that, that each country, Israel and the U.S., guarantee to each other's res citizens the, the right to travel within freely, to reside at places of their choice, and to enjoy liberty of conscience free from unlawful molestations of every kind and the most constant protection and security. On the issue of freedom of belief and expression, um, how many uh, young Arab Americans are denied entry because they belong to um, Students for Justice in Palestine? How many young American Jews are denied entry because they belong to Jewish Voice for Peace? Um, how many people have been banned, Israeli, I mean, American Jews have been banned from going because they've supported the BDS movement. There are so many questions here that, that, that like I said, create not only questions, but create the fact that Israel's not in compliance. And so when, when I would speak with the, the undersecretaries or the, 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 the U.S. ambassador, he'd say, well, Israel has security concerns. I said, fine. Then they don't get in the visa waiver program. I mean, how can you have a, a reciprocal relationship with a country that has a military occupation of one half of the people living there? Um, that is not grounds for a reciprocity um, when you're already oppressing half the population. So, it, it, look, uh, let me turn it back to you, Maya, um, and uh, and if you would give us some highlights of some of the more recent cases that we've encountered. Um, actually, Jim, I'm going to um, go to Sam um, at first, and I know that um, um, Sam, we we wanted to hear from you specifically on the issue of um, uh, that what what the senator mentioned and what Jim mentioned, and I know Jim has some additional questions. But Sam Bahor, um, let's go to you. Uh, you are a writer and advocate living in uh, uh, Palestine uh, in Ramallah, and uh, uh, your leadership on this issue has been critical for years. Please, Sam. Okay. Then came travel restrictions uh, and harassment, something AI, as was noted, knows about for a long time, because for decades they've been collecting cases and making the issue. Um, here we talk about profiling at Israeli points of entry, like the airport, harassment, the cases of harassment are not ending, being denied entry, like Jim mentioned, due to political beliefs, forcing you to open up your social media at the airport if they find something critical of Israel, on your social media platforms, it's grounds for you to be denied entry, uh, or Palestinians living under military occupation carrying an Israeli-issued ID like myself, I'm a resident here, not being, not being allowed to enter Israel, supposedly because we're a security threat to the nuclear state next door. The list is very long, and as you can see, Israeli discrimination of Palestinian Americans is not new, and the US's silence is also not new, but this silence today is deafening. Then came Biden and Israel's President Herzog in their recent meeting in DC, where an MOU was signed to make an exception for Israel, first one ever since all the other 40 countries that entered the visa waiver program did not have an exceptional period or an exceptional terms to be able to enter the program. Um, and the reciprocity and non-discriminatory stipulations were basically walked around in this MOU. The MOU, and this is the, the, the part that should make all of us human, has not yet been released. It's been issued, it's been announced, it's been told that we they have been compliant, and we haven't even seen the document yet. We don't know what the test questions were to even know if the answers were correct. And then overnight, Israel started removing some restrictions with this MOU for different categories of people that were previously heavily hindered. In other words, that entire community of Palestinian of Americans who were once deemed a security threat for so many years, overnight became kosher. And not only could go to Israel and go to the airport, but can go and sleep and visit anywhere in Israel, including Elat, 
it's actually mentioned as a one of the conditions. You, you're allowed to go to sleep in Elat, in the southern tip of Israel. It's a tourist site. Something that even the VIP holders, the people who get VIP permits, are not allowed to go there. But all of a sudden, we can go everywhere we want. No longer a security threat. So many of us here in Palestine were permitted from that point on not to have to go through Jordan, which is a headache, a burden, a cost. Uh, and now we can fly into the Israeli airport. We get a three-month tourist visa, even though we're coming home to Palestine, not to Israel. I'm just transiting through Israel when I come to Ben Gurion Airport. All I need is permission for 20 minutes to go from the airport to the West Bank. And we're not tourists, but we get tourist visas. My dog, if you're a Palestinian American from Gaza, there's an entire separate set of rules that applies to who can go and who can't. If Israel deems you a security threat, they still today can deny you entry or exit from the occupied territory without anyone knowing what the definition of security threat means. That's the same case that was there before the waiver program with the MOU and that even now after being accepted to the program. So to close, I would just ask you all to compare all that I just listed to a Jewish American coming from New York City for the first time here. They land in Ben Gurion Airport, rent a car, drive into the occupied territory, arrive at an illegal settlement, are offered a suite of subsidized services by the Israeli government that the US funds and supports, and can decide to pick up and return to the airport and fly back to the US with absolutely no interaction with any Israeli authority until they reach the airport, of course. If this is non-discriminatory, then I need to return to elementary school. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Let me um, now bring in Hanna, who uh, I know that I've heard from some of you already that th this is background and real life experience for many of you, but we are a large mixed audience. Um, so I, I think it's important to have both. And one of the things um, that both Jim and Sam shared are before this period. And I need to now bring in Hanna Hanania, who is the former past president of the American Federation of Ramallah, Palestine. Um, who can share an experience from um, the contemporary period, this testing period. Um, and let me turn it over to you, Henna. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for doing this. Um, first, let me start by saying for the past two years, we've been meeting with different departments with the administration, including the HS and state. And we've been assured for the last two years that blue is blue, like all Americans are gonna be treated equally. And I probably heard it over 30 times in over 30 different meetings that were happening in the past 24 months or so. Uh, however, I did travel this summer and I traveled in August, which was like two weeks after the testing period has started. And I did witness a lot of discrimination and profiling, just like I heard from so many other friends in the people who traveled there during that period of time. Uh, discrimination starts from the minute you enter towards the airport. Um, first, you get a visa. And that visa, they start giving more to Palestinian Americans. But from the day one, they've been kind of giving different type of visas. In some cases, it's different color. Some gets green, some gets blue. In other cases, it has on it what PAL, like means going to Palestinian territories. Um, there was many incidents that they were not even given a visa that people were given a one day, basically an entry permit to be able to go to the West Bank. And they were asked when they go to the West Bank to use the app Sam just talked about, to, to apply for a permit to be able to cross into the, the green line. Um, so there was a very clear discrimination just upon entry, but generally speaking upon entry, this, uh, things has improved way much more than any other areas. There is discriminations also whenever you crossing checkpoints and whenever you're passing from one area to the another. Uh, the West Bank, Jerusalem, in these areas, there is tons of checkpoints to be able to travel from one place to another. Pretty much all Palestinian villages, cities, towns, they're totally surrounded with checkpoints. Pretty much each one by itself is a prison by, on its own. And to be able to get out and in, you have to pass like uh, many checkpoints. And some of these checkpoints we're talking about worse than international borders, and you have to basically go through sec securities, researches, and so on. For example, there is someone who just missed, a, he's actually a police officer in New York, who just missed his flight last week, and the reason they wouldn't let him through the checkpoint 
but because they told him it's a holiday today. And because it's a holiday, they wouldn't let him go through the checkpoints. And uh, so he missed his flight uh, like that day. He tried three, four checkpoints, but by the time he finished with them, it was too late to be able to go to the airport. Anyway, they didn't let him from either one of the four. So he ended up missing his flight. Um, actually, that was his, in his case also, when he was entering, which I forgot to mention, he was not given three months visa. Like he, they keep talking about a 90 day visa and there's prosty and 90 days. We, they gave him only one month and he tried to fight it with them, telling them the program is talking about three months visa, but he couldn't get anywhere from them. All what they were willing to give him was a one month. There is many other cases that they were given less than the 90 days. Uh, he wasn't the only one. So the checkpoints is the other area where there was lots of discrimination and then exiting from there has been very miserable, pretty much for everybody, Arab American, anybody with Muslim sounding name and definitely for Palestinian Americans. There is very clear discrimination, even for before you reach the airport. Before you reach to the airport, like, uh, like a couple of miles away, there's a checkpoint that you pass by it. Um, and me and my family were going through this around mid August. When we got to basically like next is checkpoints on my American, I gave her my American passport. It says, and it's born in Jerusalem. So she kind of asked us, where did you go? How did you go? It's to be able to find out if we're Palestinians or not, which she ended up finding out that we are. And then she had us pulled to the side where someone else comes and basically search the car. In our case, it wasn't a long experience, but I heard about many cases where they basically went ahead and searched like every single thing in the car. Then when we went to, just as soon as we entered the airport, we have to talk to a security guy. And I gave him the American passport. And then he looked at it and he's like, you have Palestinian passport. We told him, yes. He said, can I have the Palestinian passport? And we said, according to even like uh, Jim, the, the rules that the Israelis put, I'm not even talking about the visa waiver program, I'm talking about the rules that the Israelis put, like you said, did say that you don't have to give the American, the Palestinian passport, you can't travel with the American passport. He refused. He totally refused to take the American passport. I insisted, he insisted, eventually it came down to the point that we cannot travel if I don't give him the Palestinian passport. I gave it to him and jokingly, he's like, put the American passports on the side, you don't really need it. And then we went to the, and then we went to through the airline check, which was fine. That was the only place where I was able to use the American passport at the United, at the Delta counter. Um, and then after that, we went to stand in line for security, just like any other airport in the security line. We stood in line for a good, maybe half an hour. And then our turn came to go through the machines for the security. And at that point they were like, oh no, guys, you are in the long line. We're like, what do you mean we're on the long line? And then she's like, now you have to go to line one. And we're like, why are you line one? She's like, that's the line you have to go to. And again, we read the stories that this is being like profiling here and we're just being picked. And she wouldn't really give us much of an answers, but she just insisted that we go to line one. We go to line one and coincidentally, we see like two different families that we know that are traveling. Coincidentally, almost every single person in that line is speaking Arabic, um, with the exception of one guy. And we tried to find out what why is he there, but we couldn't. But every single person in the line speaks Arabic. It happened, I saw friends we haven't seen in a very long time. So we took some videos there, but you can see in the video that everyone in the line is speaking Arabic. Hannah, I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off for a minute because I want to get to um, thank you so much for that. And, and you know, the, what bothered me about the memorandum of understanding, we've only seen the draft, Sam. Right. I, when I ask them, they say, we can't show it to you because it's an agreement between two states. I said, and it's an agreement between two states that compromises our rights. And so, of course, we have a right to see the damn thing. It's about us. But I, I, what's, what's aggravating is that you can fly into Ben Gurion, but that's it. Nothing else is covered. And all of the violations you're talking about become legitimate and, and they get away with it. And now I'm going to go to, uh, to Abed. Abed Ayub. Um, Abed, uh, thank you. Are you. Where is Abed? Right here. I'm on. Hey, thank you so much. Listen, um, I so appreciate what you guys are doing on this. I mean, Abed is from ADC. He's the executive director of the Anti-Discrimination Committee. Um, and the, the, the lawsuit that you're filing, just to be clear, is about the process, right, right that, that allowed this thing to pass despite the fact that 
there's no compliance. You want to talk a little about that and maybe if a few more for questions sure. that I have? Sure. Thank you. And I appreciate it. And, and thank you for the work, you know, Jim, you've done and Maya and Hanan, you know, a lot of folks on this call. Uh, it has definitely been a process. And, uh, you know, we did file a lawsuit uh, a few days ago. And as you mentioned, as Jim has mentioned a few times, the the MOU is the problem. And that was the focus. So what we filed is an APA claim that's an administrative process, uh, something about it related to the administrative process and so forth of the way the rule was implemented. So as Jim mentioned earlier, they were changing the rules, changing the way um, Israel is permitted into the program. The visa waiver program is an established program. There's rules, there's regulations, and there's a way for a country to, um, to enter the program. And in this case, that didn't happen. So they went outside of the rules, they went outside of the regulations and drafted this MOU uh, back in July, which pretty much Israel wrote the rules and, and wrote their own exam, uh, as was mentioned. And to, you know, in our opinion, at that point, that changes the dynamics a little bit. That, you know, not only um, changes the process, but that, that that's an action on, um, uh, uh, as part of the visa waiver program, we've gone from just oh, we're thinking about putting Israel in, we're going to research them. Now they're taking action, they're moving on it. And there's different procedures we felt, you know, we argued in the complaint uh, that the U.S. government should have followed. Now, there were different, you know, different opinions, uh, and, and there are many attorneys out there working on different complaints and researching the way uh, this should be challenged. There, there is no right answer. But we did feel compelled, you know, we have to. It's within our rights, within the mission of ADC and, and of many groups on this call, to at least document and put a writing what our concerns are and, and what what really we see as serious issues uh, and, and put them there and file them. And we did do that. And I do want to thank, uh, I don't know if they're on the call, but Hoi Dada, uh, Adam Shapiro really played a, a significant role in helping put this complaint together, pushing this to, you know, to fruition. We talked to many lawyers, many attorneys, got many different opinions, um, but did did file. We did ask for you know an, uh, an emergency uh, temporary restraining order. Uh, as expected, the judge denied that er order earlier today, but we are regrouping to see what the next steps. What were the grounds of the denial, Abed? They indicated that we did not show harm, uh, that there was no harm showing. So the temporary restraining order in an APA claim is granted when when the judge or, or when the plaintiffs, in our case, the, the community can show that there will be damage in between the time um, uh, up until the time of a trial or of a court date, right? So in between the time the court considers uh, the challenge at hand, the court mm -hmm. pretty much said that the, you know, there is no harm. You're unable to show harm, which of course we uh, disagree with. Um, we are going through the, uh, uh, you know, the judge's response to figure out what the next steps are. But I do want to preface that was expected. I mean, we know what we're up against here, but we do want to put our challenges out there and to put our uh, uh, you know, complaints out there. I think that's very important. And then we will see the next steps. I think it is important that we document the cases. I mean, there's the AI link, uh, ADC has a link, and there's the State Department link that's out there. We need to document these because there will be future challenges. Uh, once the program is fully implemented, then that's when we get into the talks of the the discrimination, how we're impacted. But we're, we're not going to be able to get to that point unless we have case examples, unless we're, right. we are able to show, here's an overwhelming number of our people who are implemented. The judge did cite in her uh, decision today, the the process of Israel being removed from the program, you know, they, they feel, at least the court feels that that's sufficient enough, but we know those of us that are involved in this, those that are involved in this process know that the US will not uh, take Israel out of anything. And we are up against a, a challenge, but we do have enough Right. Uh, you know, solid attorneys, legal support uh, across the country from many organizations that are committed to this. I can tell you, we had a few calls last week. We had the same number of lawyers on that call as we did for the Muslim ban calls, you know, mm -hmm. five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So it has caught the attention of the legal community. It's something that's out there. It's not only, you know, Arab attorneys or Palestinian lawyers. It's it's a broad range of attorneys from different mm -hmm. backgrounds. Thank um, you. Thanks. So Thanks, Abed. Listen, um, People use the porthole, number one, report it to ADC experiences that you have, and uh, report it to the Arab American Institute to our uh, on our port. They're all going to be available to you. Um, I'm going to thank you because I want to get to, um, we have a hard stop at, uh, at 630. 
But if you if you don't report these instances as they occur to you, or it, uh, then we won't be able to do anything about it. So reporting is going to be absolutely significant. And I bet if there are other things that people can do to support this lawsuit, please let us know. Um, and we're exploring other options as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. But I just want to I want to uh, so appreciate the fact that you've taken the initiative on this. Thank you. Let me go to Eddie Ayub. Eddie is uh, um, for many years uh, 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 worked on the on Capitol Hill, legislative director uh, to the majority leader, um, and uh, is now uh, working in the private sector, uh, but has been a mainstay in terms of his outreach to members of Congress. Uh, doing incredible work. Eddie, are you with us? This is just an action alert to our own community. We can't expect other people to do the things that we need to do for ourselves. And the absolute easiest thing, Jim, that we can do is pick up the phone and make a phone call, write a letter, write an email. Every senator, every congressman will have a link on their website. It's basic, but I can 100% assure you that the front office of every senator and every congressman counts the number of phone calls, emails, letters they get on a particular issue. Senator Van Hollen spoke about accountability and holding the administration's feet to the fire. In order to do that, it just starts with that basic outreach. You do it, get your family members to do it, get your friends to do it, just ratchet up those numbers because we have 100% control over that. We don't have control over what other people do, but we do have control over that. And Maya um, just put in the chat, the, the Van Hollen letter with the signers, which is quite impressive, uh, both senators from uh, from Illinois and, and others. I mean, it was a, it's a great group. Um, and that's it, Jim, that's a good start to interrupt, but that's a good point. Those 14 senators also deserve to hear from their constituents exactly. and the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you for signing those letters. Thank mm -hmm. you for holding our own government uh, to account. Um, just, you know, it's just as important to, to show gratitude that it is to show concern or to complain or anger. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong, as long as you do it respectfully, there's nothing wrong with expressing your anger to your senator or to your congressman, as long as you do it respectfully. And again, we spent a lot of time with the Biden campaign, uh, getting mm. them a very full statement of their support for all of our issues. And some of the language was really good. Two of the things I point out in the article, he said in the statement, a Biden-Harris administration will confront discriminatory policies that single out Arab Americans and cast entire communities under suspicion. Hmm. He also says, in quote, Joe Biden will protect the constitutional right of our citizens to free speech. He also does not support efforts by any democracy to criminalize free speech and expression, which is why he spoke out against Israel's decision to deny entry to American lawmakers because they favor boycotting Israel, meaning uh, Ilhan and, and Rashida. Uh, talk about holding feet to the fire. Um, yeah. Well, Biden's running, and and fr and frankly, we have to let him know that this is deeply disappointing. Um, one basic question was um, asked about when we say that they did not meet the requirements. Um, um, this is from Arlene um, to show that the waiver approval does not meet the requirement of bl the blue is blue. Um, can someone just concisely say why Israel does not belong in the visa waiver program? Why it doesn't meet the requirements? There's a statutory requirement of reciprocity, meaning they will treat all of our citizens the way we will treat all of their citizens. It's very clear that they are, there's a two-tier system, as Sam and Abed both uh, indicated, as Hanna indicated. And beyond that, there are many other behaviors, including at checkpoints, including discriminatory treatment on entry and on exit, that simply make it clear that they do not treat us in the same way that they treat others. Uh, others is that um, the one of the other statutory requirements is that there's a certain percentage uh, by the visa refusal rate uh, for a country to qualify. And um, the reason that there was this movement to move quickly by the September 30th, 2023 deadline is if they did not apply it in this fiscal federal year, we would be looking at next year where it's very likely Israel would not have qualified in terms of the refusal rate separate from the refer reciprocity requirement because it would be post COVID uh, travel uh, dates. So, so thank you all for being with us. Again, we'll have more Action alert out tomorrow with some talking points. Look for my article in The Nation. 
uh, go to the ADC site, go to the AAI site and register your uh, stories that as they occur.